Okay, we might get started if we can. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone for, for, for coming uh, this morning and it's my great pleasure to welcome the Darcy Lecturer for 2015, Rona Helmug. Um, Good morning everybody. Bef uh, before I... Um, uh, well, Australia's been very, um, very much on the itinerary of Darcy Lecturers for a number of years now and it's really great. We appreciate the extra time and the extra commitment that it takes to come all this way down to talk to us. Um, for many of you in the audience, the Darcy Lecture is probably largely the next hour, but I just thought it was worth pointing out that the Darcy Lecture is a lot more than that, and, and being the Darcy Lecture involves a commitment to, to not just travel and present, present lectures, but also to visit universities, to talk to students, to talk to young researchers, and that's become a, really a very, very important part of the Darcy Lecture um, program. And I certainly know a number of students that have really greatly benefited from the contacts that they've made through Darcy Lecturers and gone on to, to positions, sometimes in association with people they've met on that tour. So it's a really great mechanism for interaction and sharing of knowledge. So to our speaker, um, Reiner is the head of the Department of Hydrodynamics and Modelling of Hydro Systems in the Engineering Faculty at the University of Stuttgart. Uh, he's also, and I need to read these or I'll get them wrong, he's also the president of the International Society of Porous Media and, and uh, was and, uh, and spokesman for the International Research Training Group on nonlinearities and upscaling in porous media. So you can get an idea of that, of the sort of research that he's been involved with for a number of years. A lot of work on multi-scale multi flow and he's applied that to looking at contaminant transport in soils with non-aqueous phase liquids and problems such as CO2 sequestration and hydraulic fracturing. And it's certainly in that latter area the work that I'm most familiar with, that working on, on the water resource impacts of unconventional gas. There's a, real, there's a lot of literature, but there's a real shortage of scientifically rigorous studies in that area. And, and Ryan has made some really important contributions in that area. So with no further ado, I'll hand over. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you can clap your hands, but it's not necessary. <laughs> it's my pleasure and honor to be here. It's my first time to be in Adelaide. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. Um, the lecture uh, you have mentioned this is related to Henry Darcy. Henry, Henry Darcy uh, is this guy here. Uh, he is, uh, I, I'm sure that you have to, you know him, not personally, <laughs> of course. But uh, he has developed a very simple rule, you know this, the flux, the velocity is equal to a proportional factor, we call this hydraulic conductivity, multiply with the difference in the piezometric head. And I'm sure at the end of my talk, you will see how complex it can be and uh, how, how helpful it can be to use this kind of law. Okay, so the title of my talk is Numerical Modeling for Evaluating the competitive use of the subsurface, the influence of energy storage. It's a hot topic now uh, related to gas and uh, production in groundwater. And this work is done in cooperation with a lot of uh, partners. Uh, these are my two partners at my university. It's Holger Klass and Bernd Flemisch. You will see the faces later on. These are the current PhD students involved in this field. These are the formal ones and these are international partners. And you know the first one was a Darcy lecture in 2008, and other is in the audience, and you will see another one, it's my, Majid, later on. Okay, so the first question is, where is Stuttgart? Do you know where Stuttgart is, my friends? Oh, where do you come from? Uh, my wife is, uh, comes from around the corner. Okay, around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> it can be only this corner, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Stuttgart is the capital of the state of Baden-Württemberg. You see here parts of Stuttgart. And um, Stuttgart is famous for what? For the automotive industry. I think the two uh, headquarters, uh, main headquarters uh, are in Stuttgart. It's Mercedes on one hand and Porsche on the other one. I have a Volkswagen and a lot of bikes, try to be fair. Okay. And, uh, Stuttgart has the first TV tower built by one of my colleagues from my faculty. That's the first worldwide first TV tower. And this is the Museum for Mobility. If you have time, please come to Stuttgart, visit us, and go to this museum. It is really impressive. You see the first developed car. It was developed by Gottlieb Daimler, uh, the guy from Stuttgart. And at the end, you see 
how you can buy a Mercedes. Okay, the university, it's the University of Stuttgart, has two campi, one downtown, and one I call this concrete part. That's the concrete part here. And uh, Stuttgart is a technical university. That means, for instance, uh, dominated by engineers, physicists, chemists, and so on. And we have a huge facility at our university related to groundwater. It's so-called the Vegas facility. It looks a little bit like Las Vegas, but it's not Las Vegas. What does it mean, Vegas? Vegas means um, the facility is used oh, for the development of uh, remediation strategies and techniques for highly contaminated uh, sites. You see here different kind of tanks with different uh, uh, equipment and uh, this European test site for the, I mentioned this for the development of uh, remediation techniques. Okay, I got a sabbatical and my rector told me, Rainer, if you get a sabbatical, then you must show numbers about the university. You see all the numbers. If you're interested, you can get the numbers from the website. Okay, if you have any kind of questions or any kind of hot statements, please interrupt me. So let me start with the first part of my presentation, that is the competitive use of the subsurface. What does it mean? And what is it related to groundwater? You know, groundwater makes up about 20% of the world freshwater supply, which is about 0.6% of the entire world water. It's tiny, it's nothing, okay? Germany, we get approximately more than 70% of our freshwater from groundwater. Holland, the Netherlands, or Denmark get 100%. Uh, uh, Switzerland, 80%. If you go to the United States, I learned 60%, and here approximately 25 to 30%. That means, for instance, that is one of the source for agriculture and the source for, uh, for fresh water. But this groundwater is strongly in interaction with different kind of other activities. And this is, a, I would like to say, a list of activities. The first one I mentioned is, is related to d or l infiltrations, lighter or denser non-equiphase liquids. That means it's related to brown fields to contaminated sites, that it's one risk. But we have, we, we, we have got now new risks. One is related to the storaging of energy. I will come back to this later on. That means the chemical, mechanical, or thermal energy storage in uh, subsurface systems. That's related to the risk of methane or salt water infiltration into the groundwater. The next one is related to radioactive waste disposal sites. That it's a hot topic in Europe now. Um, how we can store atomic waste. Uh, and uh, that is related to relative contamination of the groundwater. Uh, I, I'm involved in, in a board uh, of Switzerland and they will build now two atomic waste disposal sites in the surrounding of Zurich. I will show you later on a map uh, how, where it is and uh, how risky it is. The next one, it's a hot topic for this country, I'm sure, is unconventional gas production. Uh, why it's so risky for groundwater? On one hand, for instance, uh, you can have an accident, uh, uh, and you can ac have an accident with the uh, fracking fluid uh, on, for two reasons. One, it can be that uh, the tracks can have an accident, that it's one risk. The next risk is that that you get leakage, and then the leakage means that you get an infiltration of this frac fluid directly into the groundwater. That, but there is different kind of other risks. Risk. I will come back to this later on. The next one is geothermal energy. We have a lot of trouble now with geothermal energy, especially uh, in, in, in Germany and in Switzerland. Why? We have got of, a lot of uh, micro earthquakes related to this. We stimulate the system with, with fracking to get an increase of the surface to get a better exchange between the cold and the warm water. And that means, for instance, we frack the underground. That's one risk. The other risk is, and it's one of the problems that we have in our state, that they have drilled the well across clay, a clay formation. And it's a clay formation that you know from Pisa the, in Italy. That means for it's swelling. And they have done a lousy job there. And that means, for instance, one of the cities, it's a very, it was a very nice one, is Staufen. Please have a look to the website. Uh, has now a lot of cracks in the houses, and uh, the state government has decided to close the center of the city. And this, the city is 1,800 years old. That's really a shame. Okay. Then, of course, one of the other big problems, old coal mines. I am from the Ruhr area in, in, in Germany, 
And that's the area where we have uh, produced coal the last 150, 180 years. But now we try to close all these coal mines. That means on one hand, there is uncontrolled methane in the system. The, all the shafts are open now. On the other hand, they shut down now the water management system. That means, for instance, we get now an increase of the water table. Related to this increase of the water table, you get an uncontrolled uh, displacement of the methane into the atmosphere. And there's one other problem, a very tiny one. At the last 150 years, they have used a lot of uh, environmentally unfriendly products like dioxin and so on, heavy metals. And that means related to this increase of the water table, you get an displacement of the contaminants into the groundwater level. Okay, I hope you've got an overview. And the problem is, for instance, these problems interact with each other. That means, for instance, you can have, on one hand, a groundwater well, but on the other one, it can be interact with this one. The question is, what kind of tools do you need? What kind of concepts do you need to analyze this, to make predictions for this? And I would like to explain this on the need of um, energy storage to get an impression about this. But the question is, why do we need energy storage? What does it mean, energy storage? That's related to the climate problems that we have, the climate change problems that we have. And greenhouse effect, I hope you agree with me, is not a bug, it's really a feature. And this greenhouse depends, in general, on three main gases. That is CO2, that is methane, CH4, and NO2. And we recalculate all these numbers into CO2 relevant um, um, numbers. For instance, methane, if you have water on methane, uh, is times 20 to 5 more as 1 gram CO2. That means methane is much more aggressive in comparison, in comparison to CO2 related to the climate change. Okay, it depends on the, uh, on the um, Industrial Revolution, and I did a big mistake six weeks ago in Edinburgh. I'm, I think you know this Industrial Revolution based on what? And I mentioned in the auditorium, uh, what is a great guy from Great Britain? The, the, auto, uh, the participants were shocked. You know why? He's not from Great Britain, he's from Scotland. Okay, he's a Scottish guy. And the Scottish, they believe that they are not apart from Great Britain. Okay, um, I did a big mistake. You see here, currently, <clears throat> more than 80% of the world primary energy supply is based on fuel, uh, fossil fuel, for instance, on the combustion of coal, gas, and oil. Okay, <coughs> that means what is necessary to do. I got this slide from my good friends from, from Princeton. And they have tried to analyze it, to get a feeling about it, an impression about this. You see it here. That's the timeline, and that's the amount of gigatons carbon dioxide emitted per year. In 2050, we have emitted six. In 2004, we have emitted 30. Why 2004? It's a question to the audience. Normally, I offer a German beer for this, but I haven't one. Sorry. 2004, we have had uh, Kyoto, and we have signed... 95% of the countries has signed it. You know what it means? Uh, you haven't signed it? Uh, um, they have signed that uh, we get only an increase of two degrees related to this uh, CO2 emission. That is this solid and dashed red line here. And if we cannot stop it, then we get an increase. And they have put this into wages. And each wage is equal to 100 approximately 100 gigatons CO2 in 50 years. What do you think? If we used all, this, um, all the CCS technology that we have for all coal mines, how many, how many wages do we get uh, related to this? What do you think? Question to the audience. What is your feeling, my friends? No beer, I know, but yeah? One and a half wage, a maximum, if you, if you use it for all coal uh, power plants. That means for a minute, we need all the technology that is available to get really the reduction of the uh, CO2 emission into the atmosphere. That's a big, big problem that we have. And what are you saying? Do we got, do, do we got an increase of the um, slope here or decrease after 2004? What is your feeling? Of course, you see it here, we got an increase. That is in 2010, and uh, the number is now uh, equal to 38 to 39 
Here you see it here, gigaton carbon dioxide emitted per year. That means we got really an increase the last 10, 12 years. Okay. And I saw a, a very nice article last Sunday in the Australian, was it news? It's a newspaper from the government. Uh, from the, they have had the, 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 the government uh, was meted in, in, they have had a meeting in Canberra, what I got it from the newspaper, and they have decided to decrease uh, the reduction of CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, okay, so. What is necessary to do? I think one of the ideas is, and I think that it's the idea, to transfer the world from the fuel one to the renewable one, okay? That is the main idea. That, that means, for instance, we need renewable energy sources. These are the renewable energy sources from Germany in 2014. We produced 40% of the renewable ones from hydropower. Geothermal is nothing related to the reasons that I've mentioned before. Biomass, 30%. Photovoltaic 16 and wind is 40. Is it a good uh, sign that we have 30% from biomass to groundwater? No, it's not. Why? Um, the European Commission has decided 10, 12 years ago that we have a minimum of 15% of each fuel must become from bio. Okay? But that has a strong influence on the landscape. We have a lot of corn now and on the quality of the groundwater itself. Why? We use now a lot of fertilizers and the farmers, they are not longer farmers, they are energy producers. And uh, they have contaminated a lot of uh, groundwater resources, and now the Germans and the European Commission has decided uh, to get a reduction from 30 of 10%. Okay. That is the energy outlook for 2035. I think I got this slide from BP to be as fair as possible. The, Ger the Europeans have decided uh, to get 35% in 2035, the Americans 15% and China 10%. You see here the amount, the renewable grow from 2012 to 2035. Okay, the Germans are a little bit different to this. Renewable national energy, Germany, 35% in 2020 and 80 to 100% in 2050. What is the reason for this? Very simple. The Germans have decided after this uh, accident in Japan to shut down all the atomic power plants until 2022. Okay, we have a lot of them in Germany. And the next decision is, and was, to shut down all the brown coal and dirty um, coal power plants until 2025. That's the reason why we need this kind of amount of renewable energy. But what is the problem? I will come to this later on. This is what I got from the, from the website uh, for Australia. Renewable energy sources in Australia, I think you get approximately 65% from hydropower, 22-23% uh, from wind, a little bit from solar, but you have so much sun here. <laughs> you have a sunny coast and 11% uh, <clears throat> and, and from bio. And uh, this is the end of the story. That's the, the same in, in, in Europe and the United States. I think. Uh, you need a special landscape, and uh, you need really differences, local differences in the evaluation. And uh, the story is at the end. That means we can only increase the sources from solar and from wind. These are the main two uh, sources. In um, Australia, you produce now approximately 30%, and the idea is in 2020, uh, it's a nice number here, no? 23.5%. Uh, that's the idea what I got uh, from the website. There is an, is this an official website. Uh, it's this one where you can get all this kind of information. Okay. What is the solution? We must store the energy. I think we, we need new concepts to store the energy. That means why energy storage? I will give you an example now. For instance, this is the actual demand and forecast demand for the city of San Francisco. I think it's easy to forecast this. You have the peak after noon, and uh, the lowest amount do you need is after midnight. I think you can do it for Adelaide, for Stuttgart, for other places. You will get similar results. But the problem is, for instance, that's the wind field from, from California. You can use the wind fields, the wind farms from the Baltic Sea, North Sea, and the Atlantic Sea, and so on, too. You get similar results. You get a strong fluctuation. That means, for instance, the question is how we can transfer this to this one, only if we can store the energy in adequate systems. That's the idea. Okay. 
The energy system will need more flexibility to accommodate the increased share of renewable energy. The key word is here smart interfaces and smart grids. What does it mean? The smart grid is intelligent enough to store, if possible, the energy everywhere. You can store this in your e-bike if you have one. You can store this in your e-car if you have one. You can store this in your refrigerator if you have one, <clears throat> and so on. That means, for instance, all the equipment that is available um, must be used to store the energy, to increase the flexibility. That is one possibility. But we did an additional one. For instance, you can store this approximately related 35, 40%. That means you need a capacity of 60, a little bit more than 60%, independent from this, what I've mentioned before. Okay? Of course, Tesla has offered batteries for each of us. Mm -hmm. Is this a good idea? What do you think? It's not a good idea. Why? Uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm not a partner from Tesla, but uh, uh, why very simple? Uh, if you would like to build a, a battery that's not really environmentally friendly, and you need a lot of special products for this, and you cannot produce so much batteries to come over with this kind of problem. OK, so that means we must use the subsurface system for the storage of energy. That's the key question. That's the key problem that we have. What does it mean? What is the main idea? The main idea is to use the energy to produce H2, and let us redirect, for instance, for one um, uh, possibility with CO2 to get methane. We call this methane as wind gas. We call this gas green gas. In comparison to the Americans, they call the fracking gas green gas. We call this dirty gas. But you, you see the different philosophies. Under high temperatures and high pressures, the following reaction can be produced. Synthetic nature gas. You see it here. This gas can be stored in the available gas storage network and this technology would allow us to reuse um, captured CO2 from combustion processes and so on. That's the main idea. What does it mean? That means, for instance, you can try it to transfer it or conversion of the electric energy into gas, store this uh, gas turbine if necessary and produce it again. That's the main idea. Do you, number, do you know the efficiency of this? What do you think? What is, the, is it efficient enough? Do you have a feeling about this? Do, do you know how efficient, how efficient a coal power plant is? It's approximately 36, 38 percent. And the efficiency, what I got from the literature and the discussion with the colleagues that I've had, is related to approximately 40 percent. That's not bad. That's not so bad. OK. So what kind of possibilities do we have? In general, we have four possibilities. The first one is conventional underground storage with gas power plants is an existing concept for power storage if compression runs with electric power. OK, that's the first one. The second one is classical concepts, that's a compression, it's a mechanical one, with the option of fire, nature, gas. That's the second one. There are two test cases, one in Germany, one in the States now. The third one is related to power can be converged into hydrogen and, st and stored in the underground. This new concept will be suitable for long-term storage. The automotive industry is really interested on this concept for two reasons. The first reason is they can use the infrastructure that they have. The second reason is they can use the technology that they have. For instance, they can use fuels, the fuel cells as the engine for the future. For instance, Toyota has started uh, to build one. Uh, BMW has a completely new one now. And Mercedes has a series from the, from the, from the um, no, A, what is it, A1 or A2 to, the, to, the, to buses. In Stuttgart, you can find buses that drive these fuel cells. OK. And last not least, I mentioned this, it's power to gas, methane. Com um, with the existing infrastructure, hydrogen can be converged into methane. OK? What does it mean? It means, for instance, we have two possibilities now. The first one is storage in caverns or underground chambers, or in storage in the porous space. OK? The first one is uh, related to what we use now, that it's related to huge salt domes. I think we have uh, produced huge holes in the salt domes, and we use this as a storage capacity for the gas from Russia and oil uh, from everywhere. And I think you have similar concept if you have uh, salt domes here in, in Australia too. That is one. But this is occupied. The, the delta that is available is tiny. It's less than 3%. 
We need other ones. And the other one is the storage in porous media in the subsurface system. Exploded gas reservoirs are nature geological formations that have proven their capability to store gas. For aquifer storage, so original present, um, present water brine needs to be displaced by an injection of gas into the pores and fracture system. And in general, we need a huge volume. Related to the problems that we have, it's clear we need a huge volume. I will come back to this later on. It's one of the critical points. OK. I will show you how it works with a geological, good geological storage site. I used the map from Switzerland. Do you know why I used the map from Switzerland? Very simple. Switzerland is not a part of the European Union. It's not a part of the United States. And it's completely independent. That is not the reason. I think I'm involved in this, and that's the reason why I use it. You see here the different kind of colors. The red one, the red part, is not available. I think you cannot store any kind of things there. It's not related to groundwater. The only part of Switzerland, it's the same in Germany too, this is this part here. But there are different kinds of activities. On one hand, they get 80% of the groundwater from them. Then, of course, they will build two atomic waste disposal sites there. They will store CO2 in this area there. They have different kind of activities related to uh, geothermal energy, and so on. That means, for instance, there is really a conflict between the different interests. And the question is how we can analyze it. So storage scarcity, what does it mean? Well-defined traffic mechanisms exist, exist within the storage formation. What does it mean? You can have positive uh, um, traffic mechanisms, and you can have negative ones. I will tell you, tell you at first a positive one. That CC, uh, uh, CO2, if you inject CO2 in a, in a subsurface system, the CO2 will be dissolved in the water. If the CO2 will be dissolved in water, you get an increase of the density of the water. Uh, I think the, the water is a little bit more heavy. If it's on the top of the cap rock, then you get an instability behavior, the fingering behavior, you know this. And this fingering increases the mixing. And if you get an increase of the mixing, then you get an increase of the storage capacity. That's one of the It's positive for the CCS. But it's negative for the energy. If you get the same effect for H2 and methane, then you get a decrease of the efficiency. You store more, and you will get it out. Clear? OK. So then uh, CO2, methane, H2 can be stored deep enough into, uh, to be supercritical. That means, for instance, we are really interested to transfer the gas to the supercritical behavior. Less volume, what does it mean? I will show you later on the phase diagram, then it will be clear. Caprock is adequately impermeable, continuous, and thick. You know, that's really, 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 really a big problem. Uh, not in Germany, but for instance, if you go to other countries like Alberta, we were involved in a project uh, from Canada. The, the system looks like uh, a Swiss cheese. They have drilled so many uh, uncontrolled wells there that uh, the whole system is really, pff, yeah, looks like a Swiss cheese. That means, for instance, you cannot use this aquifer as a storage capacity. OK. Then the geological environment is adequately stable. No uh, any kind of earthquakes. No pass for, uh, pathway faults or uncaptured well penetrates in the cap rock. I mentioned this. So I will come back now to this part here. I will give an example to see how they interact with each other. That is, as a motivation, geothermal power production, vice versa CCS. That's one aquifer here. It's an artificial, of course. You would like to store on one hand CO2, gas, and on the other hand, you would like to produce geothermal energy. And of course, there can be a fault zone in the system. What does it mean? It's a double system with injection extraction well. How they interact with each other. It can be that this aquifer is a groundwater system. How will geothermal system be involved? Uh, influenced if CO2 injection takes place in the same aquifer. Negative. Cold front reached extraction well earlier. You get a decrease of the efficiency of, the, of your geothermal system, one hand. And the second one, increase in production as warm brine is dispersed towards the extraction. That means you see directly there is an interaction. OK, I will give you an example related to this, related to a footprint concept. That's my colleague Holger Klass and his PhD student, uh, Alex Kissinger. They have developed for this kind of things a so-called footprint concept, but it's not a new one. I think you use similar ones for projection zones, for groundwater systems, and so on. That means, for instance, you can have a footprint for the pressure field. 
You can have a footprint for the salinity, food, uh, salinity, and you can have a footprint for the plume. But they are different, completely different. I will show you an example now. Next example to a storage site in the northern part of Germany. It's from uh, Schleswig-Holstein. It's a real case, 40 or 40 kilometers in the northern Germany, injection depth 1,500 meters. We can guarantee that we, have, that we can store the CO2 under supercritical conditions. The question is here, how does the injection in structure A, that's here, affect the pressure field in structure B? Why? On the top of this, here's a window in the system in structure B, and on the top of this, there's a huge, huge, huge groundwater aquifer. Okay? That means, for instance, if we get now a pressure field, a high pressure field, then we get an upconing of the salt water into the groundwater system related to the injection and storage of the CO2. And that is the case in this field. You see here, the plume is tiny. That's the plume here. That's a CO2 saturation plume. But the pressure field is extremely high. I think we have experts in the, in the room here. The pressure equation is an elliptic equation. That means you have an information that's a diffusive one in all directions. And you see it here, that here you get an increase of the pressure at the window. That means you get an upconing of the salt water into the fresh water. There is an overlap with two systems, with the storage side on one hand and the aquifer on the other one. OK. The question is now, I told you I'm a stupid modeler. Why modeling? OK? I will give you now an impression about this. There's leakage to the subsurface, no question. There's leakage into the groundwater. I've mentioned this and I've uh, explained you this a little bit with this example of gas, of, uh, gas storaging. If you have a leakage into the groundwater, you give groundwater contamination. You have leakage brine displacement, mechanical stress. Mechanical stress means stress failure. If you have stress failure, leakage brine displacement, you get groundwater contamination. That means it's a highly interactive, nonlinear process. The question is how we can handle this. So the modeling, ch the modeling challenges. What are the modeling challenges? What is new? The first one, we must handle dynamic boundary conditions. That means we have a high fluctuation for the in injection and the extraction. You see it here. And of course, we get hysteresis in a system. That means we get the displacement of the, the brine from gas, then the other way around, back and forth. That means we have drainage and imbibition everywhere. The next one, we must think about multi-phase, multi-component, non-other thermal systems. We get instabilities. That means we can have density instabilities and viscous instabilities. Viscous instabilities at the front and density instability, as I've mentioned before, between differences in the density related to the dissolution processes. And last not least, geological data scarcity, fold zones, brine displacement, and so on. What is our strategy? What is our idea about this? We try now to integrate highly complex systems, we nested complex systems, in less complex ones. Okay? That is the main idea. And we call this an adaptive, multi-scale, multi-physics strategy. The next five, six, seven minutes, I will explain you the main ideas about this strategy. OK, what are the relevant issues? What are the relevant processes? I mentioned this. This is related to the fluid properties. It's the phase diagram here. Good news now. That's the temperature. It's the pressure. And here I, I show three different kinds of behaviors of CO2, methane, and H2. The critical point here of CO2 is here. That means you must store the CO2 in aquifers deeper than 700, 800 meters to guarantee that you can store it under supercritical conditions. Good news now, if you would like to store methane, it's lower. If you would like to store H2, it's lower too. That means in general, you can store all this energy gas under supercritical conditions. Good news, okay? Less volume. The so next one is related to process modeling, the equations few equations. Don't worry. That means, for instance, the classical, we need the classical equations. The balance equation, that's the porosity, saturation, density, the flux, and then we can, must describe the momentum balance, that's the Navier-Stokes equation, and Darcy has helped us to transfer this very complex one to the simpler one, that's the extended Darcy's law, where you have the relative permeability of the viscosity, the permeability tensor, the pressure gradient, and the gravity classical approach. OK. We, I would like to explain to you the concept now on a two-phase, fluid-phase, two-component uh, two fluid system. 
non-isothermal system, low Reynolds numbers, Darcy's law, and in this case, we assume we have reached solid, okay? To make it as simple, it's complicated enough. If you combine this, then you get transport equation per component. We have two components in this case. That means Kapper describes the components, alpha the phases. We have two phases and two components. With the component flux, we have now the advective flux with the Darcy velocity and diffusive dispersive flux with this one here. If you sum up, then we get this kind of classical transport equation with the Darcy law. Okay? This is the classical set of equations. So, we assume that we have local thermodynamic equilibrium, that means a mechanical, thermal, and chemical one, locally for each Eulerian control volume. That means we can assume that the temperature of the solid, the water, and the gas locally is the same. Then we get this kind of energy equation, it's a classical one, and we have formulated the energy equation uh, with the um, enthalpy and the internal energy. You can reformulate this in temperature too. But if you are interested on multi-phase, multi-component systems with phase change, then it's better, tip from my side, to formulate this in, uh, in enthalpy and total energy. Then it's a little bit more stable. Okay, that's the only reason why we do this. Okay, that means the flux is based on the convective one here and the conductive one. Classical energy equation. Okay, let me explain you now the let's next few minutes the upscaling concept that we use to get an efficient, robust, straightforward uh, simula simulator. What we have done, that it's a little bit new, we have transferred all the pressure relevant quantities, all the linearities in a so-called pressure equation. And we have tried to transfer the transport equation to a very simple hyperbolic equation. That means, for instance, you have now here the pressure of the water phase, then the capillary diffusion coefficient, that's the capillary pressure, and this is the buoyancy or gravity part, the differences in the density multiply with k and the gradient of z. The transport equation for each phase is simplified now. We have a storage term, and we have here the advective part of the transfer of each phase, nothing else. Are you with me? If not, please let me know. So, what are the demands on the simulator? Simulation of huge domains, fine results of heterogeneous parameters, fine results of fluid fronts. We are, think, we are, we are interested on breakthrough time. Complex physics, nonlinearities in a system. Problems, large numbers of grid cells, large numbers of degree of freedom, complex nonlinear models. We have developed this with Max Celia together. And the idea is now to decouple the system as good as possible to make it as simple as possible. If you are really interested on these problems, then you need this kind of model. Fully coupled, nonlinear, um, non other thermal read 3D model. But you can use it only for, I would like to say, Mickey Mouse examples, but not for real cases like what I've mentioned before. What is necessary to do? At first, we have combined an adaptive grid multiscale with multi-physics. Then we are working, still working on a vertical averaging. You know the DP assumption, okay? The classical DP assumption for um, layered groundwater systems. Then you get a reduction from 3D to 2D. And we are interested to use this for multi-phase flow systems too, for this kind of systems too. That's done by Mike Celia and Jan Nordbott and other ones, okay? And last, not least, we try to combine this with quasi-analytic or analytic solutions if possible. That's the idea, to get this one. What is that in detail? What does it mean in detail? This describes the physics. This is the geological system. What does it mean? For instance, this is the high complexity, high complexity area, and the high complexity area is nested in the less complexity one. That's multi-physics. And this can be moved with the process itself. Okay, first one. Second one is we used upscaling for the geological system itself. That means, for instance, we can describe as good as possible the detailed part of the geological system in the red box and less complex in the surrounding. We upscale this. How we can do this? We use an adaptive grid with a multi-scale approach, with a multi-physics approach, the multi-dimensional one, and of course, if possible, we used a multi-time discretization in time two. That means that we have two 
areas in one solution area where we can use different kind of time discretization strategies. One is explicit and one can be implicit or a mixture of both of them. Okay, and it's involved in a so-called open source simulator. It's developed by international partners and the head of this is my colleague Bernd Flemisch. If you like it, you can download this. It's for free. You can put it in the garbage or you can use it. Okay, and if you have any kind of questions, let us know. Okay. This solution strategy is now, I mentioned all these things, is multiscale in combination with multiphysics for simplified decoupled system if possible. That's the idea. Okay? Strategy. Multiscale. I think there are a lot of multiscale concepts, finite volume ones, finite element ones. But all these kind of concepts, I'm sure that one of you are involved in this, based on the simplified system. That means, for instance, in general, they neglect the gravity effects, and they are very important for us, gravity buoyancy, and they neglect capillary forces. And we, as an environmental engineers, we need the approximation of capillary forces related to the local heterogeneities and dissolution processes. That means we need another strategy. That's the reason why we combine now numerical upscaling with an adaptive bridge refinement to get this multi-scale approach. Three slides related to this. Motivation. Why? That's a heterogeneous field here. Porosity and permeability. 100% water saturated. We inject from the left-hand side gas. Okay? This is the heterogeneity of the structure itself. This is a process heterogeneity. That means that's related to uh, entry pressure differences. Differences in the capillary forces locally. You see it here. Every area has an other entry pressure. Okay? The question is now, can we use the simplified ones or is it necessary to use the more complex ones related to the capillary factor? You see, it's not good to use this one. Why? In this case, you smear out all the kind of local heterogeneity effects related to this displacement process. But if you include the capillary pressure forces, then you get this one. Why it's so important? Straightforward. If you think about these dissolution processes that I have mentioned before, in this case, it's tiny. But in this case, you get a high dissolution behavior. Why? You see the big differences in the phase behavior. That means locally, you get a lot of steep gradients between the differences of the components from one area to another one. Okay? Locally, we need this. So, what we do? We scale up, choose representative subscale problems, and calculate core scale quantities, the classical upscaling concept. What does it mean? We use the very simple one. The main assumption that we use is a local capillary equilibrium. Do we have one in the audience that have measured capillary pressure saturation relationships? The main assumption to, to, to measure capillary pressure saturation relationships is, is that you need for each point of your capillary pressure curve, an equilibrium between your faces. That means you build a new equilibrium, then you build the phase differences to get your capillary pressure related to the phase distribution, we call this saturation. Okay? That means we use now this, as a, this assumption as a model assumption for the upscaling. That means when we have a capillary dominated system, then of course we scale up our system local capillary equilibrium. We combine this with a percolation concept to get then a new upscaled, you see it from here to here, upscaled capillary pressure for this box related to these fine ones, for drainage and for inhibition. Okay? Locally. We can do it the same for the relative permeability, for the resistance from one phase to another one. The only change is here, locally, this relative permeability is a scalar quantity. If we scale it up, then it's a tensile quantity. That means we get a direction of the phase displacement related to the upscaling in our system. Okay. How does it look like for the example that I have presented before? This is the upscaled capillary pressure, and this is the upscaled uh, relative permeability. You see it's a full tensor. Okay? You get an heterogeneity in the system itself, the direction. So. You know, upscaling is unique. If you build an integral over a partial differential equation, you get a unique result. If you do it the other way around, then it's not unique. The question is, what is to do? That means downscaling is not unique. 
What is the distribution related to certain average? That's the question. And what we have done in this case here, here are the problems that I've mentioned. We combined now our upscaling with an adaptive grid. That means, for instance, we do this downscaling with refinement of our mesh. That means a nature and effective global downscaling strategy is an adaptive grid. I will show you this. Clear for all of you, the strategy? OK. Adaptive grid. This is Markus and uh, the former student and Benjamin. We used a very simple uh, discretization scheme, two-point flux. That means cell-centered finite volumes, one dot here, one dot here. We built a flux at the interface. Very simple finite volume. But we have combined this with a multi-point flux. That means, for instance, we have directions in the system now related to the tensile behavior. That means the flux is not uh, any longer uh, perpendicular to the interface. That means, for instance, we have, we have a different. And that's the reason why we increase locally the number of fluxes. And this technique is so-called multipoint flux. We have developed this with our friend and colleague, Eva Oversmark, Oversmark from Bergen and uh, Mike Christie from um, Swansea from, uh, from Great Britain. And you can use the unstructured grids, hanging nodes, and so on. Example, very simple. If you have a streamline in this direction, then you increase the fluxes in these boxes. If you have the streamline in this direction, then you increase the fluxes in this direction. That means you can optimize the, the number of increases related to the direction of your flux itself. OK. Example. That's a classical nine-spot nine water flux. That means water displaced a non bedding phase in this case. You see here the hanging node concept and the refinement at the front coarser and finer ones, and this is the case in 3D. It works very well. Okay? So, now you can relax. <coughs> if you combine this, then we have really a multi-scale approach. What does it mean? We have two criteria that we use. The first one are the, the classical ones, T fronts, pressure fronts, saturation fronts. We do in refinement. Okay? The other one is related to model adaptivity, that means, for instance, if we have a capillary dominated system, then we can scale up, related to what I've mentioned before. Or if we have channels in a system, then we can describe the, cell, the channels more in detail related to this criteria that I've mentioned before. Okay? That means we can play with this toolbox now. Example, to give you an impression. That's an SB10 um, benchmark developed by Mike Christie and uh, Martin Blunt. Um, Mike Christie from Harold Watt and Martin Blunt from Empirical College. That's a highly heterogeneous system. You inject a wedding phase and displace the non-wedding phase here on four wells. Okay? It's a highly heterogeneous system. You see here the porosity, the log Kx, Ky, and here the log Kz distribution. There are a lot of channels in the system and so on. It can be that you have done similar things with this example too. And you see now how it works. This is, for instance, the, this, uh, the, the distribution of the wetting phase, okay, the water phase. At first, you get a refinement at the front. Now you get a coarsening related to the capillary dominated processes, and you get a refinement at the new front, and so on. And what we have done, we have done comparisons with Tuff and other ones, and this is factor 100 faster. That's not so bad. Okay. I will show you now. What's going on with multi-physics? OK, two slides. Simple. We nested the complex ones in the less complex ones, nothing else. OK, that means we follow the process. An example, this is the multi-phase non-other thermal system. We inject from the left water, and we displaced now here the water, and we have this dissolution process. That means this area is now the complex ones, single-phase multi-component, multi-phase multi-component, and that's the less complex one, OK? That means the complexity follows the process, or the other way around. It's nice to see this Mickey Mouse example. I think we are really interested on real examples. Now I will show you real examples. The first one is related to give you an expression. That is, for instance, the tent sleep formation. It's in the North Sea. Um, it's um, handled by Statoil. 
And uh, it's a benchmark that we have used uh, on an international level. Uh, groups from Australia are involved in this too. That's a domain of 10 of 10 of 0.1 kilometers. Injection, in this case, of CO2 of 15 kilograms per second for 25 years. Total simulation time, 50 years. Permeability porosity, and that's given from the geological survey from Norway. Okay. To give you only an impression, a feeling, we will come to the details a little bit later on. How it works. You see, we inject here. It's under supercritical condition. It migrates related to the density differences to the cap rock. It migrates then along the inclination of the cap rock. Now, for a German beer, if you're in Stuttgart, what is the storage capacity? What do you think of this system? I think you have 100% volume available, void space, pore space available. And which part of the void space is available for the storaging of H2, methane, CO2, and so on? What do you think? A number. What do you think? That's very important for us. Please think about this volume that we need. Feeling. What, what is your feeling? What is your impression? Please. Give a number. Come on. Each number is good. It can be that it's not. So, sorry? Five percent. He's a little bit too intelligent for us. Five percent is correct. It's a little bit, it's a little bit less than five percent. In general, I think the aquifers that we use are related to five, four, three percent. Why? You see it on this example. I will show you later on another example. That's related to the buoyancy forces in a system, related to resistance of, this, of the aquifer itself, related to the injection process, and the inclination of the, of the cap rock. That means, for instance, we need, we need huge aquifers to store our energy. You see it here? Or we need other ideas and technologies. So, uh, my friend Efenyev must go now. Okay, so I will show you at first example related to the test site from the European Union. Okay, that's the test site at first. It was the test site for CCS. It's now will be a test site for energy storage. It's a so-called the CO sink pilot plan. It's in the neighborhood of Berlin. It's in Katzin here. It's Berlin. It's Katzin. That's the formation here. It's a geological formation. It's a realistic pilot site, Ketzin. This is the injection well, and this are observation wells. Okay? That's the heterogeneous system. And uh, of course, we have done a lot of realizations. Olga has done this. And I will give you now an impression how it works related to the quality of groundwater and the migration. At first, to give you an impression, this is the injection here and you will see a cross-section of the migration of the gas in the system. I'm too, too long. Sorry. You see here, it injects. Related to the difference in the density, it's super critical. It migrates to the cap rock and related to the inclination of the cap rock and the, the pressure gradient, you see the migration of the CO2 in the system. You see now directly that you have and uh, uh, capacity of about four, five, three. Clear? That's the first one. The second one is temperature. You get an increase of the temperature related to the thermodynamic properties in a system. Is it the good news or bad news? What do you think? If you get an increase of temperature, what does it mean? You get a decrease of the dissolution behavior. I think you cannot dissolve so much uh, CO2 in a system related to the thermodynamic properties. That's a good news for energy, bad news for CCS. And last not last is the dissolution of the gas in the water. If CO2 dissolved in water, what does it mean? You change the pH value. You make it more aggressive. That means this is a highly contaminated water here now. If this highly contaminated water migrates to the groundwater, then it's immediately contaminated. OK? And you see, how it, if you have a well here, leakage, then it's contaminated. OK. Last two slides. Sorry, I'm a little bit too long. I changed my talk yesterday, and that was not a good idea. OK. Um, last example that present you now the interaction of the different aspects. This is a 10-slip formation. Do we have one in the audience that is uh, related to this? 
benchmark. It's uh, a benchmark or it's a real field in the United States. And um, they would like to use it for different kind of purposes. On one hand, they would like to store gas in a system. On the other hand, they will use it for geothermal energy. And if you would like to use it for geothermal energy, then you will inject the salt water, the brine water, again in the aquifer. Okay? And on the top of this, there's a groundwater system. The question is, how they interact with each other? Can we analyze it? Okay. You see here the strong heterogeneities in a system. That means there are channels in a system, fault zones in a system. It's a highly heterogeneous system. What we do now, we solve the problem with a different complexity locally. That means, for instance, we can change the complexity dependent on the process. That means from a fully one-phase, two-component, non-isothermal, to a two-phase, two-component, linear, and so on. Dependent on the process, what I've mentioned before. OK. Movie. It's done in cooperation with the visualization center from us, from Stuttgart. The yellow one is the injection of gas. This, the blue one is the re-injection of the brine water, and that is the extraction of the hot water, the geothermal system. And here, there is a window in the system to the groundwater system. Okay? I hope it works. You see now, related to the gravity forces, sorry, the buoyancy forces in this case, this, the gas migrates to the top, to the cap rock, and will be dis, uh, distributed in all directions. Okay? Here's the injection of uh, brine water, it, it interacts with each other, and now this front reached, ah, let me do it again. This reached this one, you get the decrease of the efficiency. And last not least, you see it here, one minute, here's the window in this, ah, here's the window in the system, here. You get an increase of the pressure, and the plume reached the window. That means you get a migration of CO2 into the groundwater, and you get an upconing of the injected, re-injected salt water into the groundwater too. Is this a good choice? It's bullshit. OK. That means you need this kind of tools to analyze this kind of very complex systems. Let me come to the end. What do we need for the future? My impression is that we must combine the simulation world with the data world. What does it mean? Before, we have used measurements that are done before as a basis for a calibration of our models. You know, we have measured the capillary pressure saturation relationship, we got heterogeneities, permeability fields, and so on, and we use this as an input for our models. Correct? But for this kind of highly dominant uh, dynamic systems, it's completely stupid. That means what we do, or what, what's necessary to do, to calibrate our models dependent on the time-related measurements. I think the weather forecast people, they do it now. And this is so-called data assimilation methods. That means, for instance, that we trigger our models. Please think about hysteresis. It's a big, big problem. We cannot use this classical hysteresis models for this kind of problems. That means we need new strategies for this kind of things. Let me come to the end. Ooh, ah, the time is over, I know. How simple do we want to choose our models? <laughs> Finding the right level of model complexity, physical processes, data availability, and time and computer resources. It's not so easy. Now I come to my old friend. It's not my friend, but uh, he's born in the neighborhood of Stuttgart. It's Einstein. He's born in Ulm. And you know this very important sentence. That is our key problem that we have. To model, a model should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And to find this, that it's one of the key problems that we have. I would like to thank you for your attention. Sorry that I'm a little bit too late. And I would like to thank my group. I have done nothing, per definition. All the other ones have done the work. And I would like to thank the National Groundwater Association for the support and uh, our Center of Excellence for Simulation, and especially of uh, our international research training group, NUPUS, uh, for this help the last 10 years. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if you're interested, there are a lot of papers, too. But it's nicer to see the, the faces. Do you have any questions? Carol. Uh, 
Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Have you already implemented all of this multi-scale multi-physics into Dumux? Yeah. Yeah. I think if you like it, I can show this later on. Uh, you know, we have releases and uh, uh, all yeah, this kind of things. We tried are to use it, but experienced some uh, difficulties. Okay. But um, I think it's implemented now. Please, we have a new release. Uh, it works. And sorry, if you have any kind of problem, send us an email or I will give you a choice. He did uh, to burn Bernd, the bridge, yeah. but I would say he wasn't very happy. Wasn't very happy. Then you must come to Stuttgart and we can discuss it a little <laughs> bit more in detail. Any other questions? Yes, uh, to Kwade first. <laughs> in your last uh, demonstration, and in that case, when you inject the carbon dioxide, right, in that case, mm -hmm. into that formation, is that filled with water already, that formation? Yep. So actually the carbon dioxide is, uh, well, remove the water, or push water. It, it's, it's a brine, it's a um, saline okay. water. Okay. Yeah. And that's the problem that you have normally, I think. You can have aquifers where you have any water, but in general, mm -hmm. The, the, the aquifers that are relevant for this kind of problems are related uh, to uh, brine uh, uh, aquifer systems. That means you displaced brine water, and then it's one of the risk for the environment, and especially for the groundwater. Why? For the long-term contamination. You would like to inject your gas or CO2 not only for one day, for 25 to 50 days, uh, 50 years. Okay? That means you get your displacement, and for the, dis for the injection time, you get an increase of your pressure field. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you get a decreasing of the pressure field. No, pre no question. You get an increase increasing of the pressure field. And the pressure field is much bigger. The footprint is much bigger as the plume itself. We have seen this. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the risky things that we have. Normally, we have analyzed only the plume itself. It's relevant for leakage of the, of, of the, of the gas. But for instance, the pressure field is an additional risk related to the upconing of salt water into the groundwater system. That's one of the big problems that we especially have in Europe uh, on on-site, onshore um, systems. Thank you. And the problem is we have only onshore systems. <laughs> Just a quick, quick question. Yeah. The, uh, it seems like you're working on a tool that um, enables uh, local refinement of yeah. the grid adaptively, yeah. so saving computational power. So the yeah. greater complexity in terms of perhaps viscosity, but relative permeability and thermodynamic yeah. effects are yeah. considered locally as, as the, the plume migrates yeah. at the either imbibition or the withdrawal front. Can you talk a bit more about how that's done? Obviously, it's great to save computer no, power. No, I, I, I like it. I, I like it. Good question. Can I get five minutes? Okay. <laughs> um, what we... Ah. Um, so that's the reason why we use multipoint flux approximation. Okay? You know, normally you have a... Two-point flux means this one. Okay? That means, for instance, you have a flux from here to here, from here to here, and here to here. So now we do um, the other part. Let me do it as simple as possible. That is a hanging node problem now. Okay? Here you have a hanging node. Where's the red one? Here. That means, for instance, the fluxes are not longer perpendicular to your interfaces. What we do now, we increase now the number of uh, fluxes. That means, for instance, we, we can do it here as a refinement, and we can do it here as a refinement. That means, for instance, we use now fluxes here, 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 or you can increase it if you like it, and then you get, uh, um, come over with the so-called non-k-orgonal behavior of the flux related to your interface. That's the main idea. If you like it, there's a very, very nice paper. It's 40 page long. I think it can be that you know this where we have explained how we have implemented this in detail. I can give it to you. But it's really related to the geometrical approximation of the local fluxes. Run this, run this test as the simulation progresses every, yeah. every time step. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's fully uh, paralyzed. And of course, it's locally conservative. And these are the main criteria that we 
need to describe this kind of problem. So what we do now, what we do now, if you like it, I can give you um, a submitted paper related to this. We transfer now the multipoint flux into a nonlinear multipoint flux. You know the advantage of this? If you use this one and you increase the fluxes, then the neighborhoods are relevant for the description of these fluxes here. Okay? That means, for instance, there isn't any kind of local behavior any longer, really local behavior any longer. But with this nonlinear flux approximation, you can guarantee that you are really get a local scheme. And then, of course, it's easier to parallelize it. It's a little bit faster. We have implemented this, we have developed this, and it works not so bad. I can, I can give it to you. And we can discuss it later on, no problem. Sorry? Of course, of course, that's not a problem. But, but you, need, you need this kind of concepts. You, I think you have two possibilities to use adaptivity. The first one is that you refine your mesh from the coarse to the fine man continuously, okay? But then you get really tricky meshes. And it takes a while, you must refresh them, you must globally refresh your mesh. You know this. And I think that was not efficient for us. It's implemented in the model too. But we have thought how we can make it as efficient as possible. And that's the reason why we use this hanging node concept. That means that we can refine locally, independent from the global mesh. That's the idea. And so it's only finite element models, not finite difference. It's, it's I think, good question, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can use classical finite volumes. That means self-centered finite volumes, or what we have, so-called box schemes. Do you, are you familiar with box schemes? One, one second. This is the, these are the finite element meshes. No? This is the finite element mesh. And if you use the subdomain collocation method, then you have, can box, build boxes related to this, so-called vertex-centered finite volumes. That means, for instance, you described your, your unknowns based on interpolation functions related to finite elements. That's a combination between finite elements and finite volumes. And then you can use tensile quantities on one hand and, of course, uh, um, nah, unstructured grids too. If you like it, I can give it to you. Okay, we might leave it there. Uh, Runners around this afternoon for people that want to follow up with questions even immediately afterwards. Um, let me remind you, I think there's uh, evaluation questionnaires that people can fill them out and leave them on the desk as you leave. Um, but just uh, remains for me to thank everyone for coming and to thank Rona once again for his talk this morning. Thank